Hi, it's Dr. Lori, the PhD Antiques Appraiser, and today I'm going to teach you about silver, the list of marks, what to look for, what I look for, what you can find at estate sales, yard sales, thrift stores. This is what you need to know. So this is all about silver. First things first, it's about the marks and where to look. So where to look is really important. People are not are, are saying, oh, I don't know the marks. I need to know the marks. You need to know how to find the marks. That's really what you need. So if you're opening a piece like this, this is a really good example. This this bracelet is a good example of where you have to find the marks, okay? Because they're not always easy to find. So what do you need? You need a loop. You definitely need the loop so you can find the marks. And the marks might be hidden. Here are some of the basic places marks usually are. They're usually on the back. They're usually on a clasp. They're usually on an edge. Or they might be on a flat area of a piece. Sometimes they're really tricky, like this piece. This piece is right on the actual lobster claw hook. So it's really kind of hard to find. I always say, get out the loop, look through the whole piece. And I mean, look at it. I always tell you, if you're gonna do some kind of tedious work like that, sit down, don't do it standing up. Take your time, look through the whole piece and try to find that all important mark. Might be on the back, might be on the clasp, might be on an edge or a flat area. So I want you to think about that. This particular piece doesn't have a lot of area to put a mark. Right? It would upset the design if you put it on one of these bubbles, if you will. So it's actually on the clasp. So you've really got to look around. You've got to scrutinize it. Okay, That's one of the things. The other things about where to look when it comes to marks is you may have to look very, very carefully on the interior. For example, on a ring, you may have to look on the interior for a mark. That's also somewhat difficult. So. Take your time, look for it, you'll find it. The marks are what's gonna tell you about fineness and value. Now I'm gonna talk about the three basic marks in a minute. Also, what is important for you to remember is sometimes the marks wear off, especially with vintage and antique jewelry, sometimes the marks actually will wear off. Like this one is starting to wear off. It says sterling on it, so you know it's sterling silver, 925 parts per thousand pure silver. But if the mark starts to wear off, now you have a different issue. But I'm gonna talk about how you value pieces without marks in a minute. Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. Also, if you're looking for different types of marks, there are, of course, three types of marks that I want you all to know. Fineness, how good the piece is, how pure it is of the silver, right? Also known as a purity mark or a fineness mark. A maker's mark, who made it? It might be an initial, might be a pictogram, might be uh, a whole name, it all depends. But a maker's mark and a location mark. So those are the three marks you really need to look for. So, like on this particular piece, this piece, which is a San Marco link, it's good to learn the links too, but this is a San Marco link necklace in sterling silver, has a couple of different marks. It has the Italy mark, and it has it right on the clasp. So it has it right here on a flat area. Easy to find, easy to read, of course, with your loop. So you can see it right there. So a couple of things, it says Italy, and then it says 925. So that means it's, again, sterling silver, 925, which indicates the sterling standard, and then Italy, so an Italian piece. That's what you wanna look for, too. When it comes to value, we'll talk about a couple of other topics, too, in a minute. So that's one of the, the types of marks you might typically see. The most common types of marks that you're gonna see together are usually a maker's mark and, of course, a fineness mark. So, for example, on this piece, this is a little vintage diaper pin, the same way that you might have a vintage cup, like a baby's cup. Um, it was typical to also have diaper pins. So this particular pair of diaper pins has just that, the most common types of markings. And they are, in fact, maker and fineness. So this one actually says Napier, and then it says Sterling on it. So you know that it's Sterling, and you know that the maker's name, of course, Napier. So that's another important element to know. So if you don't know what something is, 99 times out of 100, it's going to be a fineness mark and a maker's mark. Okay. Other marks that'll give you some clues have to do with, in fact, other types of ideas. So for example, here, a fineness mark on this piece. And also, again, and most of the time with pins, remember, the mark is going to be underneath the pin. So you've got to open up the pin, which sometimes can be difficult. <laughs> you've got to open up the pin, and then you have to actually look for the mark. 
So sometimes they have a maker, a location, or a fineness. And when they have more than one, that's going to help you, of course, easily identify the piece. So um, that's this piece. But one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that certain makers will always put their mark in the same place. For example, these two brooches are both by Swarovski. And Swarovski actually puts their mark in the same place all the time. So basically, it's a logo, and their logo is very characteristic, very well known. It's the Swan logo for Swarovski, the crystal company. And it also has a copyright or a C in a circle. A lot of you are asking me that. What's the C in the circle? What maker is that? That's usually just a copyright mark. Also, Swarovski puts on these two pins, you'll notice, at the bottom of the pin, at the very bottom of the actual pin or brooch, is the mark. And that's where you'll find the characteristic swan. But if you don't know that a swan is Swarovski, well, then you've got some problems. So pictographs, pictographs are basically the marks that are pictures. Those are very, very typical, too, and becoming much more popular in, of course, costume jewelry design and uh, sterling silver jewelry, too. When you see fineness marks or maker's marks or location marks, those are the three that you're going to be looking for. So those are your top three. But then marks get a little bit tricky. So let's look at some Tiffany pieces. These particular pieces are made by the famous Tiffany & Company in New York. So they're marketed through New York, but they may be made anywhere else around the world. So the location mark on a piece of Tiffany may not say New York, may not be made in the USA at all. So here's an example. You may have very full or extensive marks on a piece of fine silver jewelry, or you may have abbreviated or brief marks. What's the difference? It depends on the design. Design will dictate the mark. So this particular piece here is a very characteristic, some of you might recognize it. This piece is an Elsa Peretti starfish, and this is made in sterling silver. However, on the back of this piece, if you open up the pin, on the back of this piece, you're going to actually see that the mark is very extensive on this. Very hard to find. It's way in there in the middle or the belly of the starfish on this back side. See if I can get my hands out of the way. Underneath that pin, you're going to actually see that mark. And the mark is extensive. The mark says Elsa Peretti in her signature. It also says, in fact, 925. It also says AG, which basically is, of course, a silver mark, indicating silver from the periodic table, right? Then it also says Spain. So it tells you a lot. It says Tiffany and Company, too. The signature of the, of the designer, Tiffany and Company. Then it says 925 for, of course, sterling silver. And then it also says Spain for the location. That's an extensive or full mark on a piece of jewelry, particularly on a piece this small. But because this piece is so characteristic and of the artist's mature style, they want to put all the marks on it. So they find the room, but it wasn't easy. And you will need your loop to be able to see that mark. You're going to need to turn on the light on the loop, and you're going to need to really look for that particular mark. Then some are brief marks or abbreviated marks. These marks are just as important, but you need to do a little bit more detective work. So this mark actually, also on a piece of Tiffany, is actually found right on the edge of the ring. Difficult, of course, for you to find initially because everybody's looking on the inside of the ring. So this is an Atlas clock ring, of course, from the famous New York Atlas clocks of Tiffany. And this particular ring has T and CO, or for Tiffany and Company. And then it says AG925, indicating that it's sterling silver. This piece was made in the United States. However, the location mark is done away with. They don't use all of these marks because they're trying to be brief. So this is another thing that will be a little bit difficult when you're looking at marks, but it's important for value. So know that some of the big makers, the great manufacturers, the high-end sterling jewelry manufacturers, will actually use abbreviations too. So you've got to learn those. Okay, having said that, we know what types of marks they are. You know what I look for and where I look, the back, the clasp, the edge. You know also that you should store your jewelry in a jewelry box, right? I recommend this jewelry box. And of course, that for um, certain purchases, I get compensation. But this jewelry box, because it has all the separated tray, you have the separated tray where you can put everything together so things don't actually scratch one another. Very important with, of course, 
um, very important with, of course, sterling silver and, and jewelry in general. So if the design dictates, the design will basically dictate where the mark is. And that's whether or not you have a, an abbreviated mark or a full mark. Okay. Now you're asking the question, Dr. Lori, wait a minute. I want to know how to tell what's valuable. And I'm going to teach you that too. So when you want to know what's valuable, here are a couple of the clues. Indicating value is going to be very important. So for example, you want to indicate value by weight. You want to pick it up and see whether or not it's heavy. I always say, if you can put it on your neck, if you can put it on your wrist, wear it for a little bit. Sit there in the stairwell, wear it for a little bit, and of course, before you decide whether you're not going to, whether or not you're going to purchase it, to see how heavy it is on. That will be important too. So that's going to be another example. The other thing you want to think about with respect to clues will be materials, stones, or other elements that will be in the piece. For example, so you might have crystals like here. You might have, in fact, a piece like this, which is gaspiite. Right? So you might have a stone, maybe a Native American stone or a type of turquoise. You might have things like coral, or maybe you have coral, or maybe you have, of course, turquoise, or maybe you have um, amethyst, whatever you might have, those types of things. So you want to look for those types of elements as well, knowing materials. Complexity of design. How complex is the design? How difficult is the design? Is the design pretty straightforward or do you see that the designer took a lot of time with the piece? Also, the maker is going to be important. Fineness is important, right? How good it is, but the maker is important too. This piece, for example, is a Native American piece and it's marked with a couple of different types of marks. This one is by Thomas Francisco. It has a couple of marks. It has a sterling mark for fineness. It also has an arrow mark, which became the designer's sort of emblem or logo, in addition to his name. Sometimes you'll have all, those, all that information, so you can find the value. This one's worth about $250, where this particular Italian San Marco link necklace is worth about $250 as well. But sometimes you don't have all that information. Pictographs, right, pictures are going to be important, like on these Gaspii and Turquoise earrings. These earrings have a mark on the back, which is in fact a pictograph too. Kind of looks like a little mountain or a little teepee, a little triangular shape. And knowing what to call that pictograph is going to be important when you're doing your searches, right, to try to find it. So if you don't find it under teepee and you don't find it under mountain, you might find it under triangle. You might have to try more than one. That's what you're looking at there. So these particular earrings are valued just about $150 and they're really quite beautiful, but they are of a particular type by a Native American designer. Sometimes there's no marks. So you have to say, okay, I have to learn this by the design. That's where you come to these button earrings right here. And these button earrings are a really good example. On the back, they're marked sterling. But on the front, they're a very characteristic Navajo flower form. It's a stamped out piece. They're very typical of, of course, the Native American Navajo designers. And that particular piece on those earrings would tell anybody who knows jewelry, oh, that's Navajo. That's an important thing as well to be able to identify just that. When you're looking at pieces like this cross, this cross has a lot of information on it too. It actually has a maker's mark. It also has, in fact, a fineness mark. And also it has, uh, again, a Mexico mark. So it'll tell you actually where it was made too. And some of the elements like the coral in it will relate to a particular region. Now, when you're looking at pieces like that, maybe you don't have a mark at all, Pieces like this one, these earrings, are going to help you to identify what's what. So this is coral, red coral, right? And it's in a silver colored actual um, setting or mounting. Now, I say silver colored on purpose because it's not marked sterling. It's not marked in any way. This is called alpaca. There are certain types of silver jewelry that aren't really silver at all, like alpaca or German silver or nickel silver. They don't have any silver content. This doesn't have any silver content either, and it's made in Mexico. Typically, alpaca, which is what this is, is a dull gray kind of colored metal. It is zinc and tin, copper and nickel all together, no silver at all, and it actually gives a, an appearance of silver. Um, of course, nickel silver 
and German silver. Also, no silver content, but sometimes they're marked. In this case, the alpaca is not marked. However, um, sometimes they are marked as well. Just depends. But I want you to be able to identify it. So the best thing to do is to hold it up to a piece that you really know is sterling silver, like these earrings. These earrings are sterling silver, and you can see it's more of a dull gray next to the bright sterling silver of the bow earrings. So you can start to tell the difference. And as you work with these pieces, you're going to tell the difference more and more. Speaking of these earrings, these earrings help you to identify value. Why? Well, they're marked sterling, Dr. Lori. They look like sterling. They look like nice earrings. Yes, but these earrings, in fact, are stamped out, and they're very lightweight. That's nice for when you're wearing them on your ear, but in terms of value, very, very low weight means low quality, means low value. They're sterling, they're 925 parts per thousand pure, but again, the value is going to be low because they're just stamped out. They're a very, very thin sheet made into, of course, the form of that bow. So that's what you want to think about too. So you have to learn about how to recognize some of these pieces, maybe Native American pieces, or pieces by a particular designer. If you have a David Yerman piece, for example, and he works a lot in sterling silver, you're going to see the DY or the Yerman mark or name. But if you miss that, maybe you might recognize his characteristic cable. Very, very typical cable that he uses in many of his designs. So you need something recognizable to help you identify the maker if you don't have a maker mark or if you don't have, in fact, uh, again, some of the other information on your piece. If your piece isn't marked, there are ways to value it. There are ways to identify it. And that's what I'm here to teach you. I want you to learn how to succeed, how to evaluate these pieces, because you can do it. The first thing you need is a good loop the jewelry box to keep all the jewelry in good shape. And don't forget that you want to look for fineness, makers, and location marks. And you really got to look around pretty hard to be able to spot it. But I'm going to show you how to spot what's valuable. I'm Dr. Lori. Thanks for being with me. I'll see you next time.